As the Apollo program was preparing to land on the moon, some saw it as the beginning of a glorious age of exploration, while others were seeing it as the end of an expensive drain on the American budget. Early on July the 16th, 1969, vast numbers were gathering along the beaches of central Florida to witness history. The American people had been preparing for this moment for almost a decade since the late President Kennedy had responded to the Soviet Union's early superiority in space technology by setting a trip to the moon as a national goal. More than a million people were crowding the roads and causeways around Cape Canaveral that had recently been renamed Cape Kennedy. Minor dignitaries and friends and families of space workers had access to special stands constructed in the grounds of the Kennedy Space Center to see the Apollo 11 astronauts blast off. While the public had great faith in NASA's ability to land men on the moon, the experts working in the space business put their chances of success at no better than 50-50. The astronauts had spent long hours in simulators preparing for every eventuality, yet the equipment they used for practice only provided an approximation of conditions in space, with some of the test rigs appearing bizarre. A special gantry built at NASA Langley provided something approaching the experience of lunar gravity. Hours before the scheduled launch, the giant Saturn V was slowly taking fuel. Its tanks would be constantly topped up till seconds before liftoff. Michael Collins was the command module pilot. He'd flown previously on Gemini 10. Buzz Aldrin was the lunar module pilot. He'd pioneered new techniques for spacewalking on Gemini 12. And the mission commander was Neil Armstrong. On Gemini 8, his cool head and quick thinking had saved the mission from tragedy. Apollo 11 would have a fully experienced team chosen to deal with and solve difficult problems and there would be problems. Every NASA mission had built on the experience of previous missions, but there was always a point when they entered unknown territory and the pressure to reach the moon before the end of 1969 had been unrelenting. We're going to the moon together. But American people were supremely confident and launch parties were held across the country. Local entrepreneurs were quick to capitalise on the mood of celebration. The swing arm now coming back as our countdown continues. At the Kennedy Launch Centre, tension was high. The German-born rocket pioneer, Werner von Braun, his whole life had been leading up to this moment. Hello, we have a technician, a team of technicians working. Everyone at the Cape understood how many different components had to work correctly for a successful launch. Astronauts agreed that the launch made them most anxious. Firing command coming in now. This would be the sixth launch of the Saturn V booster. And while some of these flights had been a little lumpy, all were regarded as successful. T minus 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Six.
Just seconds into the flight, control was transferred from the firing room in the launch complex to mission control in Houston. Twelve minutes after launch, Apollo 11 was in low Earth orbit. Apart from a slightly rough ride with the third stage, everything had been routine. Translunar injection and docking with the lunar module were now practices that had been done many times before, and they too were achieved with little fuss. The cruise to the moon and lunar orbit had been done twice before, and flight manuals and checklists had all been rewritten with the benefit of previous experience. The Apollo system had been designed so that all the navigation information and engine burns could be made autonomously by the crew, but radio ranging techniques had improved so rapidly that mission control was now giving all instructions. However, the crew still used the onboard technology to determine their position in case of a communications problem. Command module pilots took pride in the accuracy of their navigation. Both the command and lunar modules were equipped with the Apollo Guidance Computer, one of the first practical microcomputers. For most computations, there was a manual workaround, but for the complex flight path required for the lunar module to land on the moon, the flight computer was essential. Now in lunar orbit, the crew of Apollo 11 would lose radio contact every time they passed behind the moon. During the 13th orbit, the lunar module separated from the command module. The two craft now adopted individual call signs. The command module became Columbia, and the lunar module was now Eagle. Descent to the moon happened in three separate stages, each controlled by its own computer program. The first stage was the braking phase that changed the orbit so it would reach a zone above the designated landing point. During this period, the crew were traveling feet first, looking up at the Earth. The next stage was the approach phase when the Eagle tipped up into a more vertical attitude. This was when Aldrin and Armstrong got their first view of the landing point. A long elliptical region in the Sea of Tranquility was their target. The open plain was judged to be the easiest place for the first lunar landing. Now, unexpected things began happening. Fuel in the lunar lander's tanks began sloshing around. While this was not dangerous, the motion meant the craft could give no clear indication about its pre-programmed landing site. Program alarm. The 1202. 1202. Give us a reading on the 1202 program alarm. Then the flight computer began sounding an alarm, and there was only one person in mission control that knew what a 1202 alarm was. A young software engineer understood the computer was overloaded, but that it could still look after critical functions. Roger, Delta H is looking good to us. The mission would continue. Roger, we got you. We're going at alarm. The final part of the landing sequence was still computer controlled, but it allowed the commander to override the craft's rate of descent and its positioning. As it was heading for a field of large boulders, Armstrong took control, looking for an appropriate landing area. 100 feet, three and a half down, nine forward. This took a lot longer than anyone expected. 175. 875 feet, guys looking good, down a half. 
Six forward. Fuel was running low. 60 seconds. Lights on. Six. Down two and a half. Forward. Forward. Six. 40 feet down two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down. Great shadow. Four forward. Four forward, drifting to the right a little. Ready? Down a half. 30 seconds. Forward, just. Good. Ready? Contact light. Okay, engine stop. APA at a descent. Auto descent. control, both auto descent. Engine command override off. Engine arm off. 413 is in. The relief in mission control was palpable. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twain. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Because of the distractions during the descent, no one had a clear idea of the Eagle's exact location. After the craft was made secure, the flight plan called for the astronauts to get some sleep, but Armstrong and Aldrin requested a change, which was agreed to. They began preparing for their walk on the lunar surface. Around seven hours later, Armstrong was climbing down the ladder. A black and white TV camera was now activated, and around the world, 600 million people were watching. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. This was something new. No one had thought that history would be televised with the world as witness. It had even been argued that television was a waste of time. Now NASA was rescheduling future missions so their astronauts would step onto the moon in prime time. Armstrong and Aldrin spent two and a half hours on the lunar surface, and much of that time was used in ceremonial duties such as planting the US flag and chatting to the president. The trip back to lunar orbit went smoothly. From here, the three astronauts were back on thoroughly understood ground. The three-day return cruise to Earth was a calm period before a storm of publicity obligations that the Apollo 11 astronauts had not prepared for. Armstrong, Aldrin and Collins were fated in ticker tape parades across the United States and then across the world. The generous taxpayer funding that had kept the space program going was now in doubt, and NASA was keen to build on this wave of popularity. But in the corridors of power, questions were being asked about the vast sums required to put men on the moon. With the last landing of the shuttle fleet in 2011, the United States, a major contributor to the International Space Station, was reliant upon Russia to ferry astronauts to and from the orbiting laboratory. Three, two, one, zero. But to get cargo and supplies to the ISS, NASA signed contracts with private space technology company, SpaceX. SpaceX's cargo capsule, known as Dragon, has regularly been delivering hardware and consumables to orbit since 2012. Dragon can also return from orbit. 
it's a stepping stone to the company's Dragon version 2 crew capsule that will be able to take astronauts to and from space. Due to make its first manned flight in two years, the Dragon takes advantage of new materials and technologies to cut the cost of spaceflight. Its return through the atmosphere will make use of an ablative heat shield, and the current generation of Dragons return via conventional parachute technology. But the new capsule will use propulsive deceleration technology to make a pinpoint landing, enabling it to be reused. The Falcon 9 launcher's two stages will also return to the ground for reuse. A grasshopper technology demonstrator made its first flight in 2012. SpaceX conducted a series of experimental launch and return flights at its test site in McGregor, Texas. The vehicle made eight successful flights to refine the autonomous return technique. technology has been incorporated in the Falcon 9. After launching a cargo craft, the booster's first stage attempts to return to an ocean platform. SpaceX technicians are aware that further refinements are needed. In 2006, the European Space Agency began work on a unique star mapper that became known as Gaia. Designed to orbit the Sun at a point 1.5 million kilometers beyond Earth, it will rotate, scanning our local galaxy to accurately gather positional information about the neighboring stars. Two different telescopes feed images to the probe's very large, high-definition camera. Over its five-year operational period, Gaia will rescan the same areas 70 times. As it orbits the Sun, its positional change will enable it to observe parallax differences from which accurate star distances can be determined. In addition to position and distance information, Gaia will collect two different types of spectral data. One will help determine the stellar object's speed and the other will indicate the object's chemical makeup. Gaia was successfully launched at the end of 2013 and has been functioning correctly since. Its pointing and positioning are achieved by cold nitrogen thrusters that do not compromise the satellite's thermal integrity. Gaia's data link with Earth can handle 3 megabits per second and it will be fed back to ESA's most sensitive ground stations at Sobreros, Spain, and New Norcia in Western Australia. In October 1968, a Saturn V began inching its way to Cape Kennedy's Launch Complex 39, Pad A. There had been two previous Saturn V launches, but this one, Apollo 8, would be the first to carry a crew. Originally intended as a manned test of the lunar module in Earth orbit, 
flight objectives were radically readjusted when a lunar module could not be ready in time. The flight crew was changed too. Jim Lovell was the command module pilot. And though there was no lunar module, Bill Anders was the designated lunar module pilot. Frank Borman would command the revamped mission. The original Apollo 8 astronauts were moved to Apollo 9. They would be the first men to leave Earth orbit and fly around the moon, and these astronauts had had very little time to retrain for this new mission. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. We have commit. We have, we have liftoff. Liftoff at 7.51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. On the previous Saturn V, harmonic vibration had caused the early shutdown of two engines. Action taken to rectify the problem saw a flawless launch for Apollo 8. Eleven and a half minutes after launch, the spacecraft, still attached to the upper stage, achieved orbit with both the ground staff and space crew entering an intense period of system checking. This was a risky mission. A less public reason it had been brought forward came from the CIA. Intelligence suggested that Russia was preparing a lunar orbital mission. Apollo 8, Houston. Go ahead, Houston. Apollo 8, you are go for TLI. Over. Roger, understand. We're go for TLI. TLI, Translunar Injection. Soon after, the S-4B upper stage fired, pushing Apollo 8 out of Earth orbit toward the moon. Now, a new problem arose. Frank Borman began to feel sick and threw up, which was even more unpleasant in zero gravity. Because of the attitude of the spacecraft, they could not see the moon, but through the round window, they began seeing more and more of the Earth. Soon they would be the first people to see our planet in its entirety. However, this window soon fogged with gas from the oils in the chemical sealant. Apollo 7 had also suffered from this problem. As Apollo 8 approached the moon, the crew prepared for an engine burn that would place the craft in lunar orbit. The main engine had to fire for four minutes when the command module was behind the moon, out of radio contact. This was the first time that the crew got a decent view of the moon. William Anders prepared to photograph the lunar surface. An important part of the mission was to document areas such as the Sea of Tranquility in preparation for future lunar landings. Then on the fourth orbit, they saw something astounding. Oh my God, look at that picture over there. There's the Earth coming up. Wow, is that pretty? After this mission, it was often said that they went to the moon and discovered the Earth. Got a color film, Jim? Hand me a roll of color quick, Oh man, that's cool. Hurry. Where is it? Quick. After 10 orbits of the moon, Apollo 8 fired its main engine and began its return Down here. to Earth. Just grab me a color. A color exterior. Here we go. During its cruise back, Bill Anders captured more pictures of the Earth. The Apollo 8 astronauts returned as heroes. Their flight around the moon had put NASA's space effort back on the front pages. But it was the end of 1968, and there was only one year left to reach the moon within President Kennedy's deadline. Just two months later, Russell Schweikart, Dave Scott, and Commander Jim McDivitt were preparing for the next Apollo mission. 
Apollo 9 would be the first test of the complete Apollo system. Till now, the lunar module had made only one flight when it was tested without a crew. This would be the first time two spacecraft had been launched together. And, like all Apollo missions, it would be far more complex than the mission that had preceded it. A February launch had been delayed to March the 3rd, 1969, to allow the crew to recover from a virus they had contracted. Though Apollo 9 would remain in Earth orbit, the crew faced a punishing schedule. Not only would they be the first to fly the lunar module, but a spacewalk had been planned to test the new self-contained life support system. After reaching orbit, the command and service module separated from the S-4B upper stage that carried the lunar module. They docked with the lunar lander to withdraw it from the S-4B. After separation, Apollo 9 backed away to a safe distance and ground control sent the discarded stage on a course towards the sun. The next few days were spent in manoeuvres, with the main engine being fired five times, changing the orbit in preparation for testing of the lunar module and to simulate mid-course corrections that would be needed on a trip to the moon. The crew had removed the hatches and probes to clear the connecting tunnel between the command module and the lunar module that had been named Gumdrop and Spider. These were the first NASA craft to be named since Gemini 3's Molly Brown. Every aspect of the linked spacecraft was closely monitored in mission control. Soon, McDivitt and Schweikart would fly in a machine that had no capability of returning to the ground and nothing could go wrong. In case something did go wrong and the two craft could not dock again, a spacewalk had been planned to test an outside transfer between Spider and Gumdrop. This was the Apollo program's first spacewalk and Rusty Schweikart was only connected by a nylon tether. All his oxygen and electrical power came from the portable life support system he wore on his back. Okay, Dave, come on out. Both spacecraft had been depressurized, and while Schweikart was busy at the lunar module, Dave Scott was retrieving an experimental sample from the yeah, outside of the, the command sample? module. This spacewalk was cut short because Schweikart was suffering from space sickness. The next day, Spider and Gumdrop separated for the first time. It's a nice looking machine. So is yours. Using its descent engine, Spider, the lunar module, withdrew to a distance of around 150 kilometers. The next time Dave Scott in the command module saw the lunar module, it had jettisoned its lower descent stage. All engine tests for both stages had worked well and NASA was developing confidence in their new moon craft. Before redocking with the command module, McDivitt and Schweikart did a complex series of pirouettes to allow Scott to inspect Spider from every angle. When the three astronauts were reunited, the lunar module was jettisoned, eventually to burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. They spent several more days in orbit, photographing the Earth before splashing down in the Atlantic. NASA had just nine more months to meet President Kennedy's end of the decade deadline for putting a man on the moon, but there was one more step before they made the first attempt to land. Oh, our stage is pressurized. Apollo 10 would take a lunar module to the moon and descend toward the lunar surface, but it would not land. In keeping with NASA's very tight schedule, it had a long list of questions to answer, and the mission would have the most experienced crew of any Apollo mission so far. 
Lunar Module Pilot Gene Cernan had flown on Gemini 9. Command Module Pilot John Young had flown on Gemini 3 and 10. And Commander Tom Stafford had flown on Gemini 6 and 9. One of the important problems that this mission had to solve was linked with the Moon's uneven gravitation. Previous manned and unmanned lunar orbital missions had discovered that variable concentrations of mass within the Moon had caused lunar orbits to be erratic. NASA needed to map these irregularities to fully understand how their spacecraft would perform in lunar orbit. Nine. We have ignition sequence start. Engines on. Five, four, three, two. All engines running. Launch commit. Liftoff. We have liftoff 49 minutes past the hour. Apollo 10 would be a complete rehearsal for the first lunar landing. It would be the second Apollo craft to leave Earth orbit. Docking with and extraction of the lunar module, which had been the major focus of previous missions, was becoming commonplace. Again, it's looking real stable to us. We show you close and finally. Apollo 10 was the first spacecraft to make color television transmissions and they pulled in audiences of around 1 billion. As in the previous mission, Apollo 10 had two spacecraft each needing a different call sign. The astronauts had elected to call the mothership Charlie Brown and the lunar module Snoopy after the popular Peanuts cartoon strip of the time. After this, the space crews were asked to choose names that had a little more gravitas. When they disappeared behind the moon, they fired the main engine for six minutes, which the astronauts described as being interminable. The craft went into lunar orbit as planned, and six hours later, Stafford and Cernan entered Snoopy to prepare it for descent toward the lunar surface. It was teeming with weightless flakes of mylar insulation that had come loose when the connecting tunnel had pressurized. This caused itching for the rest of the flight. But there were more problems. Charlie Brown, Houston, uh, we're concerned about this yaw bias uh, in the limb and uh, apparent slippage of the uh, docking ring. We'd like you to uh, disable... The lunar module was more than three degrees out of alignment with the command module, and air pressure in the tunnel between the two craft could not be released. Houston was worried that undocking now could damage the latches that held them together. Engineers on the ground decided that anything less than six degrees was not a problem, and Snoopy was given the all clear to undock. This was the first time a lunar module had flown in the lunar environment for which it had been designed. Mission planners were concerned that Stafford and Cernan might try to seize the opportunity to make an unauthorised landing, so Snoopy had been short-fuelled. If they did land, they could not get back. For the next eight hours, John Young would be alone in Charlie Brown. Houston, Houston. Charlie Brown, how do you read on that gate? Over. Charlie Brown, Houston, over. Snoopy dropped lower and lower, passing directly over the proposed landing site for the next Apollo mission and travelling more than 500 kilometres from the mothership. But just before they were due to jettison the descent stage, a guidance setting switch was in the wrong mode 
and the lunar module began gyrating wildly. By dumping the descent stage and switching to manual control, Tom Stafford was able to regain stability. Charlie, how was the stage good, huh? Wait till that thing blinks. Charlie Brown, uh, Houston, they got hey, staging. Uh, they uh, had a wild uh, gyration, though, but they got it under control. Over. The rendezvous went according to plan, and Apollo 10 remained in lunar orbit for another 29 hours, mapping anomalies in the lunar gravity before returning to the Earth. But even as they were near the moon, another Saturn V had been rolled out to the launch pad. Apollo 11 was being prepared for the first attempt at a landing on the moon. Allumage Vulcan. Allumage de ZAP. ESA, the European Space Agency, launches light, medium and heavy lift rockets from its facility in French Guiana, but it has no ability to bring vehicles back through the Earth's atmosphere for a safe landing. The Intermediate Experimental Vehicle, or IXV, is being developed so that ESA can master the techniques of controlled re-entry from low Earth orbit. The IXV uses the lifting body concept in combination with ceramic and carbon fibre thermal protection. Though this is a more complex technique than the common ablative heat shield made of plastic resin that dissipates heat as it vaporises, ESA wants to test a vehicle that offers greater control for more accuracy in landing. The concept vehicle will function autonomously. It is equipped with thrusters to maintain the correct attitude before it reaches the Earth's atmosphere. As it descends to 120 kilometres, the IXV encounters the upper levels of the atmosphere. At this point, it is travelling at a speed approaching 27,000 kilometres per hour. Two flat actuators keep the craft correctly aligned during this part of the re-entry. There are unanswered questions about this part of the journey where the oxygen and nitrogen molecules in the air become a high temperature plasma that does not obey the usual rules of aerodynamics. At an altitude of 26 kilometres, the craft will have slowed to 1600 kilometres per hour where the first of a series of supersonic parachutes is deployed. Though this technology is well understood, ESA still had to perform drop tests in the Mediterranean of a dummy IXV to see how their craft would behave. In mid-2014, the craft was prepared for its flight from the European spaceport in Kourou. The IXV was covered in more than 300 sensors to monitor its behaviour during all phases of its two-hour flight. Quatre, trois, deux, un, top. Allumage P80, décollage. It will be six months before the technical data has been fully understood and can be used in the design of a larger re-entry vehicle. For more than 15 years, Europe has been working on its own satellite navigation system. Called Galileo, the system is intended as a civilian, global location service as an alternative to the American GPS, which has military applications. This means average GPS users can have their service downgraded without notice. An in-orbit validation phase, using four satellites, was recently completed and new additions are being launched regularly until a constellation of 30 satellites is in service. 
Satellites 5 and 6, known as Dorisa and Malena, were sent up on August the 21st, 2014, aboard a Soyuz launcher. Initially, everything seemed to have gone well, but a design flaw in the Frigat upper stage allowed fuel lines to freeze during the extended cruise, and the satellites were delivered to elliptical rather than circular orbits. It took a while just to find where Dorisa and Milena were, and then ground staff began the detailed calculations involved in bringing the satellites back to usable positions. The low end of the orbit took both satellites through the Van Allen radiation belts, endangering the sensitive navigational electronics. Using the satellite's own manoeuvring thrusters, they were brought into usable circular orbits. After exhaustive systems checks, Dorisa and Milena were given a clean bill of health and, though their positions are not ideal, they will still be able to contribute to the Galileo constellation's function. Soon, the next two satellites, Adam and Anastasia, will go into orbit although their launch has been delayed by a thorough review of the Soyuz and its Frigat upper stage. It has been determined that the proximity of a cold helium line to the fuel line caused the freezing problem in the Frigat. 